Welcome to Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your personal objectives, financial situations, or needs. So, Shani, we talk a lot about how there's an email address in the show notes, and maybe this is just indicative of us being lonely during during lockdown or in general, but we do really love hearing from people. And, you know, we both get excited if we get an email or we get a new rating or a comment. And the other day, we got an email from Damien. And as part of Damien's sign-off, he declared himself a balance sheet that is trying to merge with a cash flow statement. <laughs> so you always make fun of me for this episode, but I think you have to admit it's catching on. So yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, I'm pretty disappointed that listeners are choosing to indulge you, Mark, but <laughs> I'm going to regret saying this. But I was thinking about this the other night when we left and we did leave out one of the three financial statements. So we did. Can anybody be an income statement? Yeah. Yeah. So an income statement. So yeah, we did balance sheet, we did cash. So income statement, I mean, you know, I don't think that's something you want to be, right? Like, don't you kind of picture like, you know, the income statement's very technical, right? So it's like the little teacher's pet and it sits there <laughs> and like in the front row of the classroom and it tells everyone about like accrual accounting and like how revenue recognition works and amortizing things like amortizing goodwill, right? So like the cash flow statement, which is what I said I was. You have a very active imagination. <laughs> yeah, that's more, but that's more badass, right? Because yeah. it's just kind of sitting there at the back of the classroom, like, you know, with its feet up on the desk saying cash is cash, right? Just like give me cash and, uh, and yeah, I'll spend it. So I don't know. I mean, you always tell me that you were a teacher's pet. Yeah. I mean, I was a bit of a teacher's pet, Mark, but I get a strange feeling that you weren't. Uh, no, no, I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little bit of a disaster, but, uh, but oh, you know why I think you're a teacher's pet? Why? Actually. So do you remember me. that day we went out to your parents' house? I do. Yeah. So God. we met up pretty early, um, yeah. in the day and we drove out there and I don't know a nice way of saying this without, you know, we had a pretty big night the night before mm -hmm. and we're not, you know, feeling a little it. rusty. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so we drive out there and your parents had spent like... I think the previous day as well, cooking this enormous Sri Lankan feast. And so we sit down and they keep bringing out like dish after dish and I'm the only one that can eat. Yeah. I mean, a side effect of being rusty, just absolutely no appetite. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were a champ. You like saved us. Well, somebody had to. Your dad <laughs> yeah. kept making hoppers. Yeah. Like he made like 20 of them and he was really excited because, you know, he showed me the little pan he made them in. Yeah. Um, but Which he, he brought over in his luggage from Sri Lanka. Like he has like three of these pans. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, it, they were, they were great, but he like, he kept bringing them over. Um, but anyway, the purpose of the story is remember you brought out, I think after having a couple other more drinks, you <laughs> brought out all of these medals that you got in high school, like academic medals. Yeah. And I mean, like the thing was you asked my parents about it and they got so excited and they went like to the garage and brought all these yeah. other medals. And medals, they're not a thing. Like academic medals are not a thing. But so I've They're got, not really a thing here either, to be honest. Oh, you just got them? But but I have this picture of Shawnee with all of these medals around your neck. Like it's it looks like one of those Michael Phelps <laughs> pictures where he's got all the golds around him. And so maybe if I our, could go red right now. I would be <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, we should have a contest where I will send that photo to somebody who wins. That's pretty funny, mate. But I actually have something from that day so I can create a opposing competition. Oh, so we're, we're having we're having different competitions. Now. Yeah. Like, so my parents dropped us off at the train station a couple of minutes early and Mark saw a BWS in the distance and decided that he wanted to get wine for the train journey home. Oh, it's uh, important. Yeah. So we had like five minutes. So you bolted to this BWS and I have a video of you running back trying to make the train with like three bottles of wine. In your head. Yeah. But if I would have made it, I would have had the wine. So yeah, I could have just waited. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, there's a, there was a point to this, um, but we can, we'll figure out those dueling competitions. Yeah. But yeah, no, there's a point to this. Another email we got from David. Mm -hmm. And so 
Yeah. That's sort of where today's episode came from, right? Exactly. So we're going to kick off a three-part series based on an email we received from David. And David requested an episode on evaluating stocks. And so he said the following. He said, analysts will give buy, hold, sell recommendations mainly based on their financial analysis, current price, and future expectations. How can the average punter evaluate whether they are right? What techniques are used to evaluate companies? And how can someone wanting to learn more develop the skills? Can someone that is not a CFA do it themselves? I ask this because I'm reading about it right now. Okay. Yeah. So good example. Email us. So we're going to do this three-part series based on that question. So in the first part, which is obviously right now, we're going to talk about how to find a great company. We'll do a second part where we talk about how to estimate the fair value, so what that company is worth. Then the third part, we'll talk about how to find a share that is right for you. And I think that third part's really important. And generally, I don't really like these kind of blanket buy, hold, sell recommendations that some analysts provide because you know they're making these recommendations without knowing what you're trying to accomplish or anything about you. But anyway, we'll talk about that in the third episode. So today, let's talk about what analysts look at to find great companies and, of course, if you can do it yourself. So maybe we should answer that first question. Can you do this on your own? What do you think, Mark? Yeah. I mean, I think, of course you can. What uh, What about you, Shani? Yeah, I, I agree. So we do this podcast in our jobs because we believe that anyone can empower themselves by education and can become successful investors. So yes, you can do this yourself. Now today, we're going to talk about evaluating shares and there are different levels of evaluation that you can do. And we'll talk about those different levels from extremely detailed analyst level evaluations to higher level views. This is so you can figure out the approach that's right for you, but also know that you don't have to do any of this to become a successful investor. It can also consist of just knowing your goals and objectives and selecting investments like funds and ETFs to help you achieve them. We think today's episode is valuable for all investors because it will lift the curtains on what analysts do, but please don't feel like you need to do what we described to reach your goals. And after all, reaching your goals is what makes you a successful investor. Yeah, no, that's a really important point, Shani. And we have one more caveat before we get started. So we're talking about a fundamental research analysis today. And that's what we believe in here at Morningstar. And a fundamental research approach means gaining a deep understanding of each investment. So, you know, at its core, a fundamental investing approach means focusing on future earnings of an investment and not price changes. But there are other approaches. So there's quantitative research, which involves the collecting and analyzing of numerical data. There's technical analysis, which is looking at charts and trying to predict price movements and it's somewhat crazy. <laughs> and, you know, we're not talking about those today. We're talking about a fundamental approach. So we're talking about studying companies, interpreting those findings and making decisions based off of them. So let's talk about that first step here, Shani, studying companies. Yeah, so good fundamental investors are students of business, and that is what Warren Buffett considers himself, a student of business. Investing in business are two very different things, and we're going to talk about the financial ratios and financial statements, but remember that all of these are just windows into the underlying company. We use these to answer a pretty simple question, is this a great company? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about why this is important. So an analyst, and we'll get into this in the second episode, but an analyst builds a discounted cash flow model when they're evaluating our company. And that involves projecting into the future cash flows. Um, and you know what you're trying to do here is you're trying to predict the future as an investor. Now, this is an informed prediction, but it's still a prediction. Well, you can't do this without understanding the business and their competitive positioning because how they do against competition is going to dictate how they do in the future. And we say this a lot on here, that competition is at the heart of capitalism, and that's because business is competition. Competition for sales involves trying to create better products and services, and it involves trying to sell things for cheaper prices. This is how you win at business. Yeah, and this is not some sort of academic exercise. It will play a key role in how you evaluate a business. So generally, if you're doing this, you would start out at the industry. So every company is classified in a sector and then an industry. So a sector is a high-level grouping of companies with similar attributes, and an industry is a more specific classification of companies, and these are generally companies that compete against each other. So, for example, there's the consumer defensive sector, and that includes companies that produce consumer goods that aren't usually impacted by economic cycles. And then you have specific industries within that, like non-alcoholic beverages or beer producers or grocery stores. So you would start with a basic analysis of the industry. So you understand at a high level what's happening. Is the industry overall expected to grow or shrink? Are there specific trends that will impact companies that compete in that industry, like higher input costs? 
So what you are trying to do here is establish the overall operating environment that companies are dealing with, because that'll give you a framework for evaluating them. And you can do very detailed research on the industry like our analysts, or you can simply read a couple of articles that talk about that industry. This is also one reason I really like our analyst reports, because they discuss the overall industry trends. So our analysts also produce special reports where there's detailed analysis of a particular industry. And these can be a great input into doing your own research. You don't have to necessarily agree with everything they say, but at least you have a starting off point. Many investors are drawn to industries where you'll see a lot of growth because it will be talked about in the media. And this is where people start to be drawn in by narrative, which is what we discussed in our thematic ETF episode. Yeah. And one of the things we discussed, right, is that's where people stop. A lot of investors will just stop there. And so they see an industry that sounds like it is a good growth story and they just decide they're going to invest. And we see this on message boards all the time. And, you know, one big thing that people talk about now is lithium, right? So kind of the basic story, lithium is a key ingredient in batteries that go into electric cars. So if more electric cars are being sold, then all the shares of lithium producers must do well, right? And, you know, you see people really... I don't know, in my opinion, kind of patting themselves on the back for making this pretty widely known observation. And I always just picture them sitting there thinking, okay, I figured this out. Like, what model roles am I going to go buy once I've, you know, struck it rich? And, you know. <laughs> Is that always your first thought? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, maybe I'm, I'm just not very nice. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's like you didn't discover the holy grail here, right? You still yeah. got to do a little bit of work to make this a good investment. Yeah. And this gets back to our original point about uh, becoming a student of business. So different companies will be competing for the future cash flows that, that will be generated in any industry. And that competition will be more intense in new industries when future prospects look right because lots of existing and new companies will decide this is the place that they want to compete. As investors, this makes our job harder, but also potentially increases the rewards of picking the right company. But we'll cover more of that in part two when we talk about finding the right share for you. For now, let's focus on finding the companies that will excel in this competition. What should we be looking for, Mark? Okay. Yeah. So we want to look for a couple things here. So regardless of how the industry is expected to perform, whether it's supposed to grow 40% a year, 2% a year, we want to look for companies that will gain market share and do well in any environment. And market share, of course, is the percentage of those sales that they will capture. So we want to look at companies that will make the most profit or cash flow off of those sales. Um, and that's represented by margin. And we want to find companies that will be able to earn the highest return on future investments that they make to grow the business. And what does all this mean? Those are, of course, companies with competitive advantages or moats. And based on the characteristics of each industry, there will be different modes that apply. So as you analyze that industry, you will know what to look for in competitive ad competitive advantages. So let's use an example. There are five moat sources that we use at Morningstar. And as a reminder, they are efficient scale, network effect, switching costs, intangible assets, and cost advantage. And if you'd like a more detailed explanation of these moats, you can listen to our last episode. Um, but when this imaginary beef with the equity mate started, you were speaking on a panel on the alcoholic beverage industry. Um, so this is a classic example of an industry where certain moats apply. So do you want to walk through them, Mark? Yeah, I was speaking on the panel. You were consuming alcoholic beverages during that. So a good time. By Very all. fast and frequently. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. So the two moats that apply to that industry are cost advantage and intangible assets. So let's start with intangible assets. That means brand. And brand is huge when you think about alcoholic drinks. So most people look for specific brands when they go to the pub or they go into a bottle shop. And that's a big competitive advantage for all these giant global brands. So when you walk in, you order a Jack Daniels in Sydney or in Cape Town, you know exactly what you're going to get. And it's really hard for upstart companies to compete at scale with these global brands. And the same holds true for cost advantage. When you are a large-scale producer, cost advantage or the ability to produce goods for less is a huge plus. And you can do this by having a larger scale and more efficient production facilities. And you can do this by getting better pricing on supplies by ordering in bulk. So this matters because it gives you two options as a company. You can sell your vodka for less than another vodka and undercut them and hopefully gain market share. Or you can sell it for the same and make more money. And you can use that extra profit to return to your shareholders or reinvest in the business through things like marketing. Morningstar Premium is designed to help you reach your investing goals. Our coverage spans over 50,000 securities and 2,000 funds and ETFs. Sign up to a four-week free trial through the link in the episode notes to access our global equity best ideas for our top picks across borders. 
find shares with sustainable, above average dividend payouts and the best opportunities at home with five star Aussie stocks. A Morningstar Premium subscription includes a ShareSide investor plan, allowing you to track all of your investment holdings in one place. And take advantage of ShareSide's investment performance and tax reporting that has been built specifically for the needs of self-directed investors. If you love premium after your four-week trial and choose to subscribe, your subscription may be tax deductible if you derive income from the share market. Sign up for a free trial today. So the question is, how do you determine a moat if you're doing your own research? Once again, I will put a plug in for our analysts. If you read our research reports, they explain in each one why they think the company has a moat or why they don't have a moat. And as I said before, you can disagree with their reasoning, but reading their opinion is a jumping off point to help you do your own research. But if you are trying to do this on your own, you should look for signs of a moat. So go in armed with the knowledge of what moats apply to what industries and then start looking for signs. Remember that the best companies have multiple moats sources, but also know that we talk a lot about qualitative measures of moats, but the results of the competitive advantages also show up in financial ratios. So, Ma, what can we look for? (laughs) Yeah. So, why don't we start with return on invested capital? So, return on invested capital gives you a sense of how well a company is using its capital to generate profits. So, we'll start with the formula. And then, Shani, you can talk about the interesting piece, like why this indicates the moat. Does that sound fair? (laughs) Sure. Yeah, it's a good deal for you. So you should think it sounds (laughs) fair. All right. So to get the return on invested capital, you take the net operating profit after tax and you divide it by the invested capital. So the net operating profit after tax is EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes multiplied by one minus the effective tax rate. And then the invested capital part is basically just adding up debt and the equity on the balance sheet. But you can find this measure on a lot of websites, including our own, so you don't have to calculate it yourself. So, of course, the most important thing is understanding what it means. So over to you, Shani. All right. So this number is showing the return that a company is getting on investments it makes. As we've said before, when you own a share, you have an ownership stake in a company and management must make decisions on how to actually allocate that capital. So we've talked before about how one of the things that they can do is return it to you as a dividend. The other thing that they can do is invest it in the company. You want that investment to earn a good return. And what a good return means is to exceed the cost of capital. So this can be a little complex of a concept, but let's look at it in simple terms. If you owned a corner store and you wanted to expand and open another one, you might go to the bank to borrow money. The bank is going to charge you an interest rate, let's say 5%, and you're paying 100 k to expand. You open that other store and you make a profit each year off of it, but you're paying the bank $5,000 a year. If you earn a 10% return on that borrowed money or $10,000 a year, you're in good shape. The return you're getting on that capital you borrowed from the bank is double what you paid for it. If you earn 5% or $5,000 a year, you are just breaking even and it makes sense to stay in business, but you're not getting much from it. If you earn 2% or $2,000 a year, you're in trouble and you're likely eventually to go out of business if you can't improve. Yeah, and it's the same thing with a bigger company. They might have more varied sources of capital, so they could have bank loans and bonds and shares and internally generated cash, but they're still trying to do the same thing earn a return in excess of their cost of capital. We believe that companies without moats will eventually get pretty close to that cost of capital as they respond to competition and basically just settle into an equilibrium where they are meeting their cost of capital and it makes sense to stay in business, but aren't really earning any excess returns. Great companies are able to maintain returns that far exceed their cost of capital. In general, a return on invested capital that is above 15% that can be maintained for a number of years is considered really good and most likely indicates that the company has a moat. So Microsoft, for example, and it's hard to argue it's not a great company, has a return on invested capital of 19.5% for the past five years. CSL, Local grown, great company has a return on invested capital of close to 22% over that same five year period. So, if you look at the overall Morningstar universe of shares that receive a Morningstar moat, you'll see similar trends. So, we rate companies with wide moats when we think they'll maintain their sustainable competitive advantage for more than 20 years, narrow moats when we think it'll last for 10 years, and no moats when we don't think that the company has one. The return on investment ca- invested capital of wide moat companies averages 19% over a 10-year period, narrow moats come in at 14.8%, and no moat companies come in at 8.6%. Okay, pretty pretty profound. (laughs) 
So the next indicators <laughs> that you can look at when doing research to find great companies is to look at the operating margin and the net margin. So margin is a term that represents how a company translates a sale into a profit. So basically, once you take out all the expenses associated with that sale, how much profit is left over? And margin comes in different flavors. So the operating margin is the difference between sales and the profit that is made after taking away production costs and sales costs, but not removing interest or taxes. Net margin is just looking at the overall profit and dividing it by the sales or revenue. So once again, Shani, you get all the good parts. I'll turn it <laughs> okay. over to you and you can explain why this matters. All right. So let's go back to when we looked at that example of alcohol, since that is intuitive to people. When you walk into a pub, you can order a gin and tonic or a tanqueray and tonic. The gin and tonic will likely be cheaper, but many people are willing to pay more for certain brands. If you've established a successful brand that consumers are willing to pay more for, then you'll have a higher margin over the same product that is bottled with a different brand. The brand or intangible asset is driving your margin higher. Conversely, the other moat source in the same industry is cost advantage. Selling something for more is good for your margin and producing something for cheaper is also good for your margin. In this case, Tanqueray is produced by Diageo, which is a global alcoholic beverage giant. When Diageo is ordering the barley that goes into the gin, they can probably get a better price than if Mark and I opened our own little gin distillery. They would get a better price on the glass for the bottle. They'd also be able to ship it around the world cheaper. Individually, and especially when you combine these two moat sources, you're getting a higher margin. So margin is another indicator that you have a company with a sustainable competitive advantage. Yeah, and Diageo, as you can imagine, is a wide moat stock, according to our analysts, and the moat sources are intangible assets and cost advantage. And I checked the other day, so I've owned Diageo for 14 years. Did you buy it just hoping that send you samples or like products? Yeah, no, I, I actually, I probably bought it because I wanted to feel good that I spend most of my money on their products, right? So I figure a little bit of every dollar I spend comes back to me as a shareholder. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Good way to justify it. So when you're looking at margin, there isn't really a set number you should look for because every industry is really different. But this is a case where you can just compare different companies within the same industry and look for the ones that have the highest margin. And once again, when we look at the shares in our coverage universe, we can see the difference. Wide moat shares had a 10-year operating margin of 21.1%, narrow moat 14.7%, and no moat 7.6%. When we turn our attention to net margin of the same 10-year period, we have wide moat shares coming in at 14.1%, narrow moat at 9%, and no moat at 4.4%. Okay, let's sum up a moat and why this matters for investors. So the key here is, of course, to think like a business owner. What is the return that is being achieved on cash that is invested in the business? Is it significantly higher than the cost of capital? If it is, then over time, that extra return will accrue to you as the company keeps making profits, investing those profits in the business and earning extra return on those investments. That is compounding. What matters to you as a business owner is that for every dollar of sales that the company makes, more of that is profit because that profit flows to you. So in dividend payments and share buybacks and money that can be reinvested in the business at higher returns. So finding a company with a sustainable competitive balance isn't a meme stock. It isn't going to be talked up on a chat board. It isn't going to go to the moon. But over time, these advantages will accrue to you as an investor. So let's finish up this episode with a bit of a summary. We want this to be valuable for all types of investors, for people who want to spend their time trying to replicate what analysts do, and for people who want to try and take a higher level look. So let's start with a detailed analysis. Start with the industry. Really understand the drivers for the industry. Warren Buffett once famously said that he only invests within his circle of competence. This quote gets a lot of attention, and truthfully, a lot of it was used to calling him washed up when he didn't jump on the dot-com bandwagon. Well, he turned out to be right. If you want to do a detailed industry analysis, then you first have to acknowledge that different industries have different levels of complexity, and we all have different levels of knowledge and experience. The semiconductor industry is different than looking at beer companies. Trying to figure out early stage biotech is different than looking at grocery stores. That's right, Shani. If you want to get into the details and really understand the workings of an industry that you don't have personal experience in and is really complicated, then get ready to do some work. If you want to take a higher level look at an industry, you can rely on experts who will do the heavy lifting. But that doesn't mean you should blindly follow their views. Go in informed. Read the different moat sources in detail so you really understand what they are and how they work. Compare different companies and try and notice what is different and why. 
read dissenting opinions that challenge those viewpoints. Think like a business owner. And please remember that anyone can do this. It doesn't take some fancy education or credentials. It just takes a bit of work. All right, Shani, we did it. We have finished another episode. One thing that we do need to say about our conference. So we've talked about our conference the last two weeks. Our conference, because of apparently there's a COVID outbreak <laughs> in New South Wales. What? I mean, who knew? Yeah, exactly. Um, so our conference has been delayed till February. Anyone who wrote in or anyone who still wants to write in, add a comment and a rating. Um, we'll do the same deal. We'll give you a free ticket. It's in early February in Sydney. We'll give you a free ticket to go online and watch it. And we'll give you um, a heavily discounted ticket to go watch it in person. So please keep those comments coming. Please share this podcast with your friends and family. And once again, our email address, my email address is in the show notes. So please send thoughts and suggestions. And like David, you might have an episode dedicated to you. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.